Hello. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's going on, Jabra Agassino? Welcome to another episode of the Agassino Zinger Show. Hope you guys are doing well, man. Hope you guys are in a good place. Hope you're feeling amazing. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling good. I hope you are feeling even better than I am, you know? Than I am. Than I bloody am. Man, how's it going, man? What's the deal? What's the, what's the word? Like, it's been a while, hasn't it? This is number, episode what? Episode number 71 of the Agassino Zinger Show, by the way, in case you haven't uh, remembered with me, your host, Agostino. I'm happy to be back, actually. Happy and raring to go. This is a super last-minute um, episode, as you might be able to tell. If you're watching this on YouTube, please click on subscribe, share with your friends. You know that lovely YouTube bullshit. But if, you watch, if you're watching on YouTube, then you'd see I'm sitting here with a really beat-up vest on and a really dodgy hat that's on backwards. And as you can see from the background behind me, it's pretty late at night. I'm not gonna tell you how late, but it's late. And if you're wondering, I guess you know why are you sitting in your in your uh, living room, it's kind of whispering but not whispering, and you're wearing a vest and a hat indoors? Good question, dear listener. The reason why I'm doing such a thing is because I am getting ready to go to bed very soon, but not that soon. You know, it's, who, who who wants to who wants to go to bed these days? And then I'm also getting ready to go on holiday, I'm going to Madrid, sunny, sunny, sunny Madrid in Spain for the weekend to go see the brunette's family, hang out with a few of her friends, uh, get a bit locked up, you know, do the old British on holiday thing. And then hopefully come back here in the land of fruit and honey in one piece. That's the plan. Please, God, do not let it get fucked up. So, um, yeah. For once, I've actually packed. I'm all ready to go. I've got a quite a light, a light bag that I've taken with me. Somehow, I couldn't decide which books to take, so I've got, I've got like four books I'm taking with me to to Spain, which is probably not the best idea, right? I'm actually gonna get, I'm actually gonna get them out now, so you can check as well. Um, so the books that I'm taking with me on my trip, because you know a man can't be with his books even on a weekend trip. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able. You know, you don't. <laughs> When I leave, I'm probably going to decide which one I want to take because I think this is a bit ridiculous. This doesn't make any sense why I've got all these amount, this amount of books, right? But this is the books I'm taking with me, right? On a weekend trip to Madrid, which is like, I don't know, an hour and a half or two hours away from here, from London for, for the most part. And mm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have that much time to read them, especially when I've got the brunette nattering in my ear for most of the trip and her mates and her family. But, you know. These things happen sometimes. So, if you wonder what books I'm taking with me, I'm going to take Mindset by Carol Dweck, which I just started reading now, and it's fucking amazing. Really good, also sobering, and um, very insightful. I've got Holy Terror, a kind of unofficial autobiography on the great Andy Warhol, right? I've got Daily Stoic, because I've been reading this forever, you know? It's, my, it's a book that I've been reading since last year, I think I had it. I just keep going through it every year, highlighting bits that I like, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, Black Rednecks, White Liberals, which is an amazing, 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 amazing book that I highly recommend you guys check out, especially if you're trying to figure out what the whole Candace Owens, Black Republican sort of lark is about. This kind of sheds some light on it. It's not as mean-spirited and as nasty as what Candace Owens is talking about, and it's not as uh, attack doggy as what Tanasi Coates kind of like uh, quite eloquently described her as. It's not that mean, but it does kind of represent another... It does give paint another another picture of what it meant to be uh, a black redneck and a white liberal, especially before the sixties in America. So if you if you're interested in that, definitely I recommend you check that out. But look, look at these books I'm taking with me to Madrid. Does that make any sense with me? Does it make any sense? Um, for those of you listening on the audio, I've got four books which I just read out the titles to you, and I, you know, it's it's fair to say the books that I buy are not small pamphlets, or the books that anyone sells these days aren't small pamphlets, right? I, I don't. There used to be a time where, there, there was a time where books were really small. I remember that being a thing. Or maybe I just had, I don't know, maybe I just didn't, I wasn't really paying attention. But I do remember books being a lot smaller. I remember there were, you had books that you read, right? Like uh, The Great Gatsby. And then you had like textbooks, like maths books and shit. That, that, that was it. There was no in between. But now you have books like, I don't know, like Tim Ferriss, for instance. He's got his book, The Tribal Mentors, which is sitting over there on the other side of the, of the table. And he's got another book, um, The 4-Hour Chef, which are fucking Bibles, right? They're kind of self-help books, but they've done, they've kind of made in the style of a textbook. That's kind of kind of come into vogue a little bit more. And usually, whenever they do first runs of new books that I want to read, it always 
they always tend to have them be hard backs, which is always quite annoying. But I guess that's part and parcel of the maybe it's part of the book publishing world, right? You kind of have to do that. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, I've got four books here. I'm probably gonna have to whittle them down to one or to two, maybe. I'm I'm definitely gonna take Daily Stoic with me. I found I found these I found these little um monthly meditations on stoicism very 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 interesting and in case you're wondering what is the daily stoic i guess you know the daily stoic is uh by the reading the cover of it it says it's 366 meditations on wisdom perseverance and on the art of living by ryan holiday ryan holiday is one of my favorite authors i've just got his new book um on audible or i downloaded it so on ibooks um called conspiracy where he kind of talks about he made an entire book ex expose about the whole uh, Gorka thing when Peter Till, one of the former founders of PayPal, took down Gorka because of the, you know, they were releasing all these un, they were kind of diving into people's business that they didn't need to dive into. I think they kind of ousted Peter Till as being homosexual before he had come out to any friends or anything. And then I think they were also responsible for publishing the video or something of Hulk Hogan. I think the sex tape or something or whatever got Hulk Hogan in trouble. Remember when Hulk Hogan got in trouble when um, he got um, stripped of all these accolades in WWE and knocked out of the Hall of Fame, all that shit. Yeah, basically, Ryan Holiday wrote a new book. His new book out now is called Conspiracy, but he's written The Daily Stoic, he's written um, The Obstacles Away, um, Trust Me I'm Lying, which is an amazing book about his time when he used to be the marketing manager of American Apparel under Dov Cherney, however you pronounce his name. If you know anything about the American Apparel guy, you'll know that, you know, that book's fucking serious and another book that i've got as well obstacles away hmm. stoic da, 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 da. anyway there's another book he's got as well that i really recommend but i definitely recommend you check out Ryan holiday just because his career directory has been amazing you know he started off being marketing manager of american apparel when he was like 20 something so super super young and then from then on he just kind of like he kind of, it seems as if he purposely took a step back and just became a writer. Um, but some of his books that he's written, especially his articles, just check him out on, on Twitter. He's a really good person to follow on Twitter. He always, he always puts out really um, insightful kind of like quotes on stoicism and just, just general great quotes that he puts out. And his article he writes are amazing. Check him out on Medium. I think there's another publication that he writes for too that you should check out. So definitely recommend you check out Ryan Holiday. But I definitely want to take this with me because, you know, I'm rabbit, I've been rabbing on this, rabbing on about this for the past five minutes anyway. So I definitely something I want to take. Mindset, because it kind of made me question a couple of things. Just now, I, I read this on my lunch break today. I kind of got started on it. I'm kind of through the first, but kind of what, quarter of it, whatever, right? So I, I try and read at least two hours a day to I managed to read an hour. So this is about an hour. And then this is about an hour's worth of reading, kind of, right? Yeah, a little bit. Bait 40 minutes, I'd say, for the most part. Um, so, yeah, um, this book is really good, actually, about mindset. It essentially, it breaks it down to, um, it kind of, it goes back to the idea of, like, nature and nurture. But they kind of just, Carol Dweck kind of segments it in in terms of, like, a growth and a, what is it? A growth and what's the other one? Growth mindset and something else ba 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 let's see here i highlighted something already da, 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 da. oh it's about so it's about even it's about people's mindsets right so the idea behind it is about if you're a kid and you got i think it gives an example about if you're a kid and you got given bad results right for a test you thought you were going to get high results and you got you thought you're going to get a you get a c then on the then when you're going home and you go, before you go home you well you go to your car to go home and you and then you see that you got a parking ticket then when you go call when you call your friend about what's happened like the parking ticket and the whole scores your friend kind of blows you off so you kind of got three back to back um quote unquote losses right or l's so this book kind of breaks down people in two groups of like well, what what do you see that scenario as do you see that scenario as an opportunity for you to like bitch and moan that the world's out to get you or do you see that's opportunity for you to grow in each individual part which means maybe studying a little bit harder for the test that you didn't get the high result in maybe it's uh making sure that you pay the correct fee when you're parking your car or maybe contesting the fine or does it involve you having to call your friend and maybe clarifying 
what the issue was did when you called them or maybe letting them know that the one you did call them and you didn't get an answer that you liked that you were a bit upset blah blah blah, blah. so it kind of breaks them into two groups i wish i could remember what the, what the first one is growth mindset and something else so this book by Kyle Beck, i highly recommend you check it out it's an essential reading for those of you who've kind of always felt as if because i don't know i've read the i read the book about grit as well earlier by another lady who the name escapes me and i kind of got the I, it's kind of worn me around because i used to always be more of a nature person right i used to think it was quite innate like they were winners and losers because sometimes whenever you speak it's like when you speak to somebody and they can only see the negative in something i sometimes can't even get i used to be not i used to not to be able to understand how someone could formulate that sort of an opinion right like everything that happened that was bad was bad forever it wasn't like it was like whenever they got given a bad piece of news they couldn't see how it could possibly turn out to be positive which it's not to be it's not me being overly happy happy enough to optimistic but that kind of level of pessimism just never it never it never seemed like something you could shake in my own opinion right it just formed as something that you could just do but then i guess when you think about it a lot and you look read these kind of books you start to realize that that sort of pessimism is the end product but there's a train of thought behind it right so you kind of have to go back to the root cause and get the person to kind of reflect on how they got to that decision not the idea that oh no it's just not gonna happen not gonna happen that not gonna happen is just the result of it that's just what you get at the end that's not the paper that comes out but you have to go to the actual root to actually go to the actual file and figure out okay how did you get to that decision making process and from there maybe you can have if the and obviously the major major part of it the person has to be open to learning they have to be open to kind of wanting to change what they've been doing before and they might they have to be open also to the idea that maybe what they were doing before wasn't working and what they should do now is maybe try something else because you know it's that famous what's that einstein quote about people um instantly doing things, the same things again and again expecting different results but it's not really insanity that's what everyone does right because it's comfortable it's easier it's it's more you you feel more uncomfortable and more at e and more less at ease and out of your comfort zone and exposed and open to ridicule when you try something new right because you know what's safe you know what works it's like i always use the adage of like um or i always use because i hate people when people say that thing you don't know what i say right <laughs> whatever you don't speak to me but anyway um i've always believed right that it's the same idea whenever you go into like a pret a manger a mcdonald's a burger king a subway right you time sometimes you go in there with the idea of like trying something new but then by the time especially if you especially if there's a long queue or there's no queue right and you're getting rushed so either way sometimes when you got too much time to think and you're in a long queue or when you got no time to think and you catch them and so there's no queue in there when you get you just revert back to type you just go back to what you're used to so if you're like oh i'm gonna try something new i'm gonna do this new thing like mm, no you're not mate you're going to do exactly what you've done every single time and you're going to order the exact same meal because it's comfortable it's easy you don't want to you don't want that weird eerie feeling of like ordering something new in the menu and then having it and figuring out oh, i'm wasting my money because it's shit or whatever it may be or you didn't like a certain thing so life sometimes i think for the most part we give people stick for that kind of idea of like oh oh you're insane man you're doing the same thing again and again for different results but we all do it in other parts of our lives because it's just an easier way to go about life isn't it because you just we just kind of want to make life black and white and easy we kind of want to make like life a uh, like or unlike you know button but it's not as easy as that so these kind of books have kind of finally turned me around and i'm finally getting to the point now where i'm kind of thinking you know what with with the right student or with an open mind you can change anyone's habits or anyone's mindset you can you really can especially if you come out with love especially if you come out with compassion and you're really open to kind of uh guide the person through that journey i think it is i don't think there's such a thing as a lost cause anymore and i used to really believe it just and again it's not me being overly judgmental but it's just you know whenever you interact with somebody that is the complete opposite of how you has the complete opposite idea of how you see things especially when it's not something you know overly personal you kind of really think huh how the fuck did you fit how the, how did you get so far in life like thinking that way you know like generally thinking that you know um i had conversation with people some people like this sometimes where they're like they have like a weird grandiose idea of self right they have a delusions of grandeur and they just can't seem to figure out that maybe the reason why they get held back is because they're not humble enough to accept the position that they're in now 
and make the necessary changes, implement the necessary habits, uh, perform necessary duties to get to where they need to get to. Because in their head, they've they've convinced themselves that they're David Beckham. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what what or how. There's there's been probably little to no uh, external a- a- affirmation, right? There's been no one that's been coming up to you and saying, "Oh my God, you remind me of some of this guy who played for Man United." It's just your con. It's just somehow some people have a weird brain where it kind of like not a weird brain where they kind of have like a closed circuit, right? A closed circuit loop. It kind of just kind of just goes around and around and around and reaffirms anything that they kind of put in there. So sometimes I used to interact with people like that sometimes, and especially when I've when I was of the thinking that people would would kind of acquiesce to kind of how I saw things if we if we got to talking long enough. You start to realize mm, they're not gonna acquiesce. They're not gonna. They don't come. They're gonna come round to what you're gonna say, mate. People have their own ideas, and as we've seen with politics nowadays, like the more you attack someone in their position, the more they just double down and hanker down on it because no one wants to come up, or no one, but some people would prefer not to say that they're wrong, right? Because they don't want to look Im- ash- dumb or embarrassed or ashamed, right? It's the same reason why these celebrities, when the movie doesn't do well, they just disappear and they don't talk again. And they don't come again to around the TV and, until you probably f- hope you forget about it and they, and they hit another one at the park, which I never really got. Especially in this era where everyone's vlogging and stuff. If you're a movie star and your, f- move and your thing doesn't do well or your TV series flops, that vlog after the flop is probably the most important vlog you'll ever do. That Instagram story, that Snapchat, that's going to be the that's gonna be the best piece of content you've ever made, especially when it comes from a real vulnerable place, you know, like... That's what people want to see. They don't want to see the fact that you're on the red carpet and swanning yourself around and shit. Like, yeah, I'm over that. But actually, on the subject of the books, I've got this weird thing, right? I'm not sure anyone else has has the same same position as me on this, but hear me out. I always say I buy these books every month and stuff, things I, I, I like to read, right? It's like my little... Um, uh, I guess I maybe did it in terms of trying to form a good habit, right? Because I was maybe forming bad habits before like right drinking drugs and stuff you're doing a bit too much of that stuff so maybe i did this to myself to kind of make discipline myself to always buy books so that because i when i buy these books i read them all right i'm not going to buy them have them stacked up on my table for nothing i actually read all the books so maybe i did it in terms of like to kind of uh discipline myself make sure that i'm on a straight and narrow like you know actually don't fuck around buy your books but there's also a weird, I don't know, I, f- I feel, right, this is just my own, own opinion, as if there's like a weird, um, there's a weird battle against, there's a weird, not battle, but there's, there's forces outside there, right, that don't really like it or kind of look down upon you when you're overly reading, right, like when you like books or you like to read articles or you can quote things. There's kind of a bit of a, like a, uh, a, an internal roll of your eyes. Now, I don't necessarily go out of my way to say what I read or to mention stuff that I'm reading on the internet or whatever stuff I see in a magazine, but I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because I don't really have many friends, right? Many close friends that I kind of socialize with on an everyday basis. You know, I've got colleagues at work that I hang out with sometimes. I've got maybe some people I might see on the weekends here and there. If I go to a certain area, right? If I happen to go to Dawson, I might see certain people. If I go to the South, I'll see different small people. If I go to North, different people, blah, 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 blah. So it's not even like the same group of people. It's like a different community of them, right? So I don't necessarily have that. I don't necessarily have that base where I can, where I can constantly unload that kind of conversation. So whenever I have a conversation with someone, right? Any, any stranger, inevitably something that I've read, seen, um, listened to, like in a podcast will never to be come up and i sometimes feel as if like it doesn't it's not something it's not like i'm trying to it's not like i'm trying to show them how much i read right or let them know what i listen to but i sometimes get the feeling that they get they get that feeling and there's also this idea that sometimes especially i heard this backhanded compliment a couple of times with my books and stuff like oh what book are you pretending to read now right and I get it, right? I get it, because if I was if I was that person, I was looking at me, I'd be like, "What the fuck's this guy, man?" Do you know what I mean reading books all the time, saying this? Yeah, you know I mean it's just, it's just annoying, isn't it? It's just just annoying. I, I, I like I get it. It's just fucking annoying. Like, put your book down and just I don't know, just boil your brains out like everyone else is doing. Do you know what I mean like stop being such a I don't know. Just stop finding things to stimulate your mind, and it? it's just annoying, right? It's like the guy in the bar that knows everyone, all the languages. It's like uh, after twenty minutes, I'm pretty sure everyone's gonna want to punch him in the face, right? 
I'm not I'm pretty sure, but some people would want to. Not me, because I want to be that guy, right? I want to bloody be like um limitless, isn't it? Like Brandy Cooper and limitless. Take that pill and just start. I mean, fighting and shit. Have a six pack and just start speaking mad languages. <laughs> that would be so sick. But I do sometimes get that feeling, and it's uh, my reaction to it lately, right? Which is something I've never thought I'd do in a million years. Is to kind of kind of hide my books. I found myself hiding my books. Whether it's putting them in a backpack, whether it's when I walk out with them outside, I kind of always, I always have the kind of cover facing, um, in, uh, inside my body. So when I'm holding it in my hand, right, I kind of have it facing my ribs. I don't have the cover facing out, so people can read it. Um, it's very weird, man. Whenever I go to read somewhere in a public space, I always try and pick the depth, the deepest corner away from everyone, so no one can kind of see. It's very, very strange. Even when I'm on a train, I'll kind of lower the book down so no one can see the cover again. It's a super strange thing, isn't it? Like, I think so. Like, it's like, what am I doing that's any different to anyone else? You know what I mean? Everyone's kind of looking down anyway, whether it's at a phone, at a free newspaper, at their trainers, looking down at their, maybe they got they bought a new bag or something, right? Everyone's sort of looking down anyway. Looking up is, you know, weird because you might catch someone's eyes. Or like I do. I remember I actually love doing that actually. Oh my God. I actually love, love, love looking eyes of strangers and just like trying to stare them out on trains. <laughs> it was so hilarious, man. That was one of the best like kind of, you know, just kind of internal pranks that you never even record or anything. Like you just do them for yourself. Um, or like I used to go on the train or the buses and just sit eerily close next to somebody in an empty carriage. So you know sometimes when you get on a train and you have like an empty carriage or a bus and it's like, I don't know, it's the first couple of stops. I'll just go sit unnecessarily close to somebody, like just right next to them, or the seat behind, or the seat in front. Do you know what I mean? And you can just you can just feel the fucking vibe change. You can just feel them getting annoyed. Or when or the best one, you know what the best one is, right? The best prank I used to like doing is you sit next to someone uh, on a packed bus, so it's packed, right? No seats anyway. So you just have to sit next to them. Oh, sorry, man. You just sit, right? Or you do the kind of polite sit where you sort of like on a corner, right? You're like, oh, you know, I don't really want to be here. Blah blah blah. But then, when everyone gets off, or people are slowly getting off, and people are jumping, because people do it at the time, right? Sometimes, it's slowly, so the, the bus or train slowly empties, and everyone kind of moves to a seat that's got more room next to them, right? Naturally, right? That's what a normal person would do. Huh? Not I. I would remain seated in that seat next to that person and just vibe it out <laughs> until the very bitter end. And you could just feel them getting annoyed. Like, what the fuck? There's a seat right in front of you, especially when you're in the bus and you've got the, double, the upper deck. And you've got the seats in, like in rows, right? And there's like a rows of like, five rows of seats in front of you, free. You're still sitting next to that dude that you sat next to 20 minutes ago. <laughs> oh, first off, for shit. Anyway, but my mind is so mad. But anyway, um, s- someone saying your mind is so, imagine telling yourself your mind is so mad. That, that that's how to pat yourself on the head, man. But yeah, um, I I hide my books a lot, man, which is really bad. Um, because I feel as if like intellectual intellectualism is not really rated highly these days people don't really give a shit if you read shit right everyone's kind of like we this weird little group thing where they're sharing the same seven guardian iron calls every every other week right um i get it for the most part but you know i don't necessarily do this as well for um external gratification either i'm not looking for pats on the back or people to say oh my god that's great what you're doing like could care less right so i'm not that bothered about it in general but it's just an interesting thing to analyze you know like people really hate it when you read books man like i i can feel the disdain around me i can feel it like for sure strangers colleagues friends i can feel the kind of like oh here he goes reader reedy here he goes reedy aggy you know reedy reedy like i get it i get it i get it i get it it's one of the, i don't i haven't necessarily got an opinion on it yet i haven't really you know i don't really get annoyed by it because i understand man you know if i if i saw me reading books i'd get pissed off too but say la vie what else is on the ticket? What else is on the ticket? And what else do I want to speak about with you lovely people? Ah, la, la, la. What's here? Da, 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 da. Oh, this great article actually. <laughs> ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Show. Hopefully you guys can see this now on here. Yes, you can. Awesome. Cool. So. If you're not, I'm going to link all these articles into the, uh, if you're not watching this, I'll link all the articles in the description below and you guys can check it out yourself. So, 
Next thing's my one of my second big loves or another big love in my life apart from reading is DJing or just going out and having a good time actually slash right slash going out and having a good time. I'd say I'm an, I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of nightlife right as opposed to I'm a DJ. I think I'm a, I'm just a nightlife fan, a connoisseur of getting fucked up. You know that's my kind of like mo. Right? Forget being one of those vloggers and shit. I want to be a professional. Do you know what I mean? Just like going out and just getting on it every single weekend. That'd be an amazing job. But somehow making content around it, right? It would probably be disastrous, right? I'd probably get Harvey Weinstein in a couple of months into it. But, but it'd be a fun, fun, fun ride. But I'm a big fan of nightlife, man. I just love it. Like, to be honest, on a serious note, I just, I'm real big, big fan of it. The idea of, um, just these different soundscapes right in terms of the promotions and who's putting them on um the thought that goes into the lineups because i've i've all, i used to organize parties myself and i know how hard it can be to book the people that you want and how many iterations of a lineup you have to go through before it's before the one you actually publish actually sees the night of day um the amount of time it takes to kind of actually plan it ahead of time um the, just in general dealing with agents blah 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 blah, blah. so and, and then crafting the lineup, right? Soundscape, I was thinking, okay, who fits well? Who should play La? Who should play this? Who should play that? It's just an amazing, an amazing, amazing, amazing thing. So going into different parties and seeing how they've kind of fine-tuned this lineup, fine-tuned the actual space itself, right? Speakers that they've used, uh, machines that they've used, sound equipment that they've used, the people at the door, the location of the actual party itself what genre is it how much is it what time of year is it on just fucking insane there's so many variables in that make it so much fun so so much fun like it's something there's it, it could never get boring like especially when you come I, I think that's probably what helps me because i come at it 60 percent in like in, in in love with nightlife and 40 percent just in love with just the idea of like going from like being like this fairly normal and fairly sober to just getting completely cane right there's something really satisfying about the idea of like progressively throughout the night um accompanied by this amazing soundtrack right of these djs playing from for the entire night or you from if it can even start from you at home playing a, a mix that you found on spotify or soundcloud or something and then playing that and then maybe syncing over some tracks onto your iphone or android and then hopping onto a train and then getting in there so from constant from like zero to 100 levels of like sobriety right you're going from sober to absolutely wasted and you're being accompanied by this amazing soundtrack underneath i think it's amazing absolutely amazing so i'd say i'm a fan of nightlife more so than a dj and one of the but one of the things i do love about djs right especially the ones that i kind of follow are the ones that get on it too right that have a good time those are the ones i love right i've never really been a big ben ufo fan for instance right because he's just a, like he's surgeon right he's a surgeon he doesn't drink I, I, i've not seen him drink I've, i don't i don't think i've even seen him dance right um behind the decks like he's an amazing dj but he doesn't look like he's having fun or he doesn't look like he'd be a fun time out let's say right and that's that's again that could be completely off base and ben ufo could be probably one of the nicest people you could go out with and he's super fun and he likes to do everything right but or maybe he doesn't because you know he's just a different kind of person but I prefer the person that's like a bit of a maverick, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit on the edge, right? Uh, for lack of a better term, uh, a rock star DJ, right? That's the kind of thing that I want to see. But also, not even a rock star DJ, just like that's that's a bit um, reductive, right? But it's it's the idea that underground music anyway attracts a certain type of person, right? That want to go. Like I went to Berlin the other the other week or the other month to run the half marathon, but essentially to go out in Berlin and enjoy myself and have a good time, right? And go to some sort of underground parties, underground clubs, blah 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 blah. There's a t certain type of person who leaves their house, right? Gets dressed up and goes to an underground party somewhere. So I know about people who they don't know doing God knows what, right? So for the most part, you want your you want your teacher to reflect the people on the dance floor. But it doesn't usually happen. But then I saw this amazing interview, right, with this um, lady DJ, right, called Dr. Rubinstein, right, from Berlin, which is an amazing, amazing, amazing interview. And it really kind of does away with the idea that, you know, DJ shouldn't be having fun, DJ shouldn't be on the dance floor 
or having a good time in general. And I like the idea that she says when she says when she goes to DJ because she's a big DJ. She plays at you know all the all the big clubs in Berlin, and she mentions something along the lines of like when she's playing a, a party that she actually wants to attend, she'll DJ do a set and just jump on the dance floor, and then people will be shocked that she's there because you know she's a big DJ. But it kind of reminds me of the thing that um. I, f- I remember hearing Tyler the Creator saying a couple other people, right, when they go see the bands playing Coachella or other festivals, instead of having that festival pass, instead of because they're obviously they're performing, instead of standing on stage and watching and watching the artist from behind, right, which is always kind of a weird angle. I've always thought, in my opinion, again, it, again, just me in it, right? Why would you stand behind the artist? It's like I can't even see what you're doing, right? He would instead go in the front, so the, usually the kind of front section is reserved for VIP. So just stand there, and that's having a good, that's a better time. And I think, yeah, I I I hundred percent agree. I'd much rather do that than, you know, stand aside the stage. And that's kind of the same idea that Dr. Rubenstein had with um. Hope you're pronouncing her name right. Dr. Rubenstein had with this interview. But there's a, there's a section here that I kind of wanted to just pick out and read that I thought was really really interesting. So um, what does it say here? It says um. There are so Dr. Rubin says in this interview with Electronic Beats, right? And the interview is called Dr. Rubenstein on Acid Techno Dancing and a Love for Rave Culture. You should check it out, but I'll link it in the descriptions below. She says, and I quote, There are a lot of unwritten rules about what to do. If you want to become successful into techno, like the claim necessity to produce and release your own music, but that's not for me. I rarely see any other DJ on the dance floor. Sometimes I reckon I, I'm recognized while I'm dancing and people often say like, oh my God, it's so cool that you're dancing with us. And I'm thinking, where else should I be dancing? And I think that's amazing, right? Because I know for me, when I used to promote parties, I used to love being in the smoking area, right? Because, you know, just you want to be the center of attention. You want everyone to kind of come around and say, oh my God, great party, hey. Oh. You know I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a pure, it's pure narcissism, right? You just want your ego to get petted, especially, or you got to get stroked, sorry. I always say petted. You want your ego to get stroked, especially when you're, especially when you're put in a night and it's, it's flopped. The, 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 the previous four have been a complete failure and the lineup you had before had had to change seven times and you know just the general politics of just like putting on the party when you finally do have a good one you kind of want to be out front i knew i did anyway right but then also when you're djing sometimes it can sometimes you can sometimes get this is this um you can sometimes form this weird detachment from dancing from the dance floor because you're so used to the your perspective is always from behind the booth right it's sort of like people that are used to always going to um, festivals or or gigs always have VIP. You have a different experience than I do, the general, you know, the GA guy, right? The general admission, the kind of like basic, basic person. You have a different level, you have a different perspective of what a gig or a party should be. So then when you do, imagine when you, you do the opposite, right? Imagine when you're, imagine when you, for the first time decide to go back on the dance floor or you decide for the first time to just buy like a general adva- a general ticket it, it will throw you off a bit right because you're used to just you know this kind of nice gated area where you can kind of stand because usually dj booths are quite nice to stand in especially if they're big enough because there's room because there's not a lot of people there usually right because not a lot, not everyone can be behind there and there's loads of popcorns you can pick out you can get a drink you can maybe do your drugs in peace blah blah, blah. it's a nice area i, I kind of get it right but for the most part, I found a lot of my learnings, right? A lot of my, I've gained a lot of my skills from being able to kind of flirt in between the both, right? Understanding that the best DJs that I loved were the ones that were interactive or that were able to kind of, it looked like they wanted to be on the dance floor just as much as you, just as much as you wanted to be in the decks. I remember that's the same thing, Faye, feeling I had when I saw Seth Troxler. Like he was just like, like it felt as if like if he could, he would play 10 songs in advance and just join us on the dance floor and get on it, right? And we wanted to do this. We wanted to be behind him in the booth, like patting him on the back and telling him how amazing he was. So I think that that is one of the best things about nightlife, right? That, and that's what and that's what kind of that probably explains why so many people that are involved in the culture, whether they're promoters, event managers, uh, DJs themselves, producers, whatever, or it come from the. Uh, it, it's usually uh, from the bottom upwards. It's never usually from the bottom downwards, right? It's like, or from just from the outside, it's usually guys that used to like get on it, go out, have a good time, right? Who kind of maybe over time, over a long, long period of time, finally thought, you know what, I want to get involved as well. And they kind of finally bought a laptop, got a MIDI player inside making songs or DJing and stuff. 
I would imagine so. Like that's probably the reason why a lot of it happens that way. For the most part, anyway. But yeah, I'm a big fan of Dr. Rubenstein. It was a great, great, great interview that I recommend you definitely you check out. Um, there's another quote here as well that I want to quickly read that might be of interest as well. Dr. Rubenstein quotes, If I'm not playing, you won't ever find me in a DJ booth. It's really not a fun place to, for me. I also don't let people hang out in the booth while I'm playing. It's distracting to me. I'm working. I'm trying to build a special connection with the crowd. And if there's always people passing by and staring at the dance floor, it doesn't work. That is great, right? But that's coming from a a, uh, a position of not privilege, but she's earned the right to do that. Like I remember, I think I spoke to somebody, another DJ guy about this uh, a few weeks ago. But you have to kind of earn that that privilege of like, you know, because I get that feeling just from people that take ask requests, right? But for the most part, I'm not playing in like uh, big Berlin clubs where for the most part, everyone kind of has this weird collective understanding that we're all in this together and we're all just going to allow he or she to kind of dictate uh, what we should listen to tonight, right? You rarely, I rarely ever, if ever see people in Berlin or maybe most high level highly or well known electronic underground electronic dance clubs telling a dj what they want to play right it's usually kind of lower rung kind of places right or not lower rung but places that do not necessarily cater to that kind of crowd so when you're playing there it's easier to do that sort of thing and i guess in general you do want to kind of do your job especially if you're a bigger dj and you've got four gigs in one night the last thing you need is another two minute conversation about how good that diana ross song was right um but I also love that idea, right? The idea that she's coming in there, she's gonna she's gonna have a good time before, she's gonna DJ, she's gonna let you guys hang out, but don't hang out in the booth and don't stare at the floor <laughs> when she's playing because it puts her off. I think she's like absolutely so so cool. And I think one last quote which I pointed at here, which I'll read to you. Dr. Rubenstein she says, and I quote, I just prefer being independent and not being tied to a party, club, or label. This might make it harder, I guess, but I enjoy being on my own. Now, this is something that kind of threw me off a little bit. Because um, I've never really heard that kind of perspective on coming up as being a DJ. Because essentially, when you want to play, well, I think so. The rule is, for me anyway, this is my own interpretation from, like, I don't know, 10 or so years of, like, putting on nights and uh djing myself right or attempting to dj myself the the easiest way to get in the door right is to put on your own party so that's easy to get in right because for the most part no one's really gonna book you anywhere you want to play right not like let, let's not say anywhere but anywhere you really want to play just from you being a dj alone and just practicing at home it doesn't really happen that way right and if it does happen that way usually it happens because you've made a song you've got good contacts or you just worked for somebody for free for a long, long time and they find out you DJs and you went up that kind of route, which happens a lot too, right? But for the most part, if you really want to get involved and you want to really develop and progress, it won't, it won't be, it won't be a, um, it won't be a, uh, what do you say? It won't be an instant thing. It won't happen overnight, right? But you will get amazing at the end. You'll be amazing at the end of it, especially if you keep diligent and you kind of like keep on it. Because I know a few friends of mine, especially at the time when I kind of fell off, who are still doing it now, who are kind of way, 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 way up there. The kind of easy way to do it is just to put on a party, right? And But then the other idea about it is that if you can't put on a party, get a residency. And a residency can mean that you play for a particular club or bar every single month or every week or whatever it may be, right? They might have you on a contract for like six months or whatever, so you're guaranteed a certain amount of pay, blah, 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 blah. Or it could mean you are tied to a certain promoter or a party, right? So you play for these type of people. So they fly you out to certain places, blah, blah, blah. You're part of their residence. And that's a way to kind of get gain your foothold in the kind of uh, scene in general. But it's interesting to see Dr. Rubenstein's point of view of like, she doesn't want to be a social, she doesn't want to be tied down to any per label, party or bar. She just plays everywhere. But that might be a more of a Berlin thing because I'm sure there's a, another girl too who I remember seeing who plays at Club Division there, about blank, um, somewhere else and somewhere else. Like, And I'm not sure if they're owned by, the, I'm not sure if they all use the same booking agent or whatever, but it was four, uh, it was four very, very distinct distinctly different clubs right but even for berlin right because most of them play techno but i remember club wise are all quite different 
So maybe that's a Berlin thing. And plus, a lot of the clubs are quite in... Are you, not a lot of them, but some of the clubs are in a close proximity to each other, right? They're sort of like kind of in the same sort of area. So maybe that kind of helped. But it's an interesting point of view. I've never really heard anyone say that. Like, instead of trying to be a resident at a certain club, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to do it on my own and just like move around, right? And just... You can still move around being a resident. Well, maybe you can't because I guess if you're a resident and you're playing for a big club, you'll, they'll obviously get you in on the dates that everyone else wants you to play, right? So that necessarily mean you can't necessarily go other places. And you might be playing for the same crowd again and again and again, which I can understand can maybe a bit tired. It, it can be tiresome maybe to some people, but I thought that interview was awesome, man. And like I said before, I, I just love it. I just love DJs that have a good time and get on it. I don't like the robots. Um, so, yeah. So if you're any, any Ben, ben UFO fans out there who kind of got butt hurt about what I said, I apologize, mate. But... Come on, who who doesn't like if if you if you know who Ricardo Villalobos Ricardo Villalobos is and if you don't please Google him right now Ricardo Villalobos I'm actually gonna link a a video of Ricardo let me make a note of it on this computer here actually before I move into the next subject uh, Ricardo Villalobos uh, gear vid right I'm gonna I'm gonna link it on here actually so you guys can check it out but Ricardo Villalobos is an absolute legend. Who do you rather see, right? Ricardo Villalobos doing his thing, like flailing his arms, spinning around, pirouetting and shit, or just Ben UFO just like, don't get me wrong, killing it, right? Absolutely destroying the room, but just like, you know, like a fucking doctor, you know what I mean? Just like a surgeon, just like precision, just not even, I, I've never seen, I don't think I've just seen Ben UFO even do a, do a two-step. I know I might be exaggerating here, I'm going over the edge, I'm being disrespectful, whatever. hopefully I'm not, because, you know, it's just DJ me on a booth, but, I don't think I've ever seen him, no. I don't think I've seen him do a two-step. I just, he just like, you know, he kills it. But Jesus, man, have a little bit of fun, mate. <laughs> um, uh, what else? Next subject. Talk about Cali the way a little bit. Hmm, what I talk, what I noticed here? I put an interview on Caramel Bobby from GQ, which I'll probably, ah, you know what, I'll skip that for another interview. Um, oh, Radar Radio Controversy. This is this is probably super late talking about this, but you know, you've probably seen it already everywhere. Um, I guess some people, I guess, not, I guess, I guess a couple of girls came out or a few girls, maybe came out and accused someone from the station, not sure if it were presenters or people that work there of sexual misconduct, which led to a few other instances coming out. And then I'm assuming radar radio tried to cover it up or try to like play it down, which then led to the backlash which then led to some girl posting on Tumblr or somebody or somewhere else like an op-ed about how they have a culture of like hiding or not hiding of like not acknowledging those kind of things that are occurring in a building and eventually the public outrage was enough to kind of like uh the public outrage got to a point where Red Red decided to kind of suspend uh streaming for a period of time i'm not sure if they're still suspended now because controversy like this is always interesting to me right it's that 48 hour thing right i remember drake saying ages ago one time right um after 48 hours, if, if anyone still cares, that's when you address it sort of thing, right? I mem- I'm, I'm, let's see if there's this. Are they actually still operational now or are they still offline? Because that would be interesting to see. Because um, I remember they put out something about they were, they were kind of like pausing, not suspending, they were kind of putting a pause on streaming anything. Now, they tweet anything? No, they haven't tweeted anything since April 16th. And... The last tweet they've gotten here is we have decided to suspend broadcasting until we are in position to address the recent contra- commentary around aspects of the station. It's nearly been a month and they haven't said anything, which is a long, long time. So that's, that's very, very interesting. Uh, are they still posting things on featured article? No, the last post is April the 4th. They've got an article on M. Honcho. So, yeah, it's been actually it's been quiet for the minute. They're not, they're not doing anything. No on air, no, Nothing's been on air for the whole time. So, it's interesting because I remember it kind of leaking all over social because I kept seeing people that I know, right? Um, like friends of mine who got shows on there saying, oh, it's with great it's with great regret. But after the... Everyone kind of had the same sort of line. It was, well, it was very... It was just a very weird... Social media is strange, man. Social, social justice... Social justice warriors, not social justice, or social justice on social media is very strange. Uh, the way it kind of unfolds, because everyone kind of had the same blurb, and then everyone was kind of saying the same thing, but no one was really talking about it. And then I had to kind of dig a bit deeper to find out what actually happened. But maybe I came on my sh- I came on my feed late. I I know um maybe that was I I uh, didn't see all the kind of like allegations and shit. But I had to kind of dig through to the allegations, and when I did see the allegations. 
it, what it stems to me again this is me not reading that much into it i'm not that kind of well versed in the whole topic again so take my opinion only with a pinch of salt but what from what it seems to me or outside looking in it just seems like that friction between like goons right road guys and hipsters it just doesn't it just didn't it just didn't work it doesn't work i think for the most part and it just didn't work right they come from two different worlds if they were in school right one would be the bully and one would get beat and one be one group would be getting bullied and the road guys wouldn't be the ones getting bullied let's just be sure real on that right and it never really works but for the most part i don't know why but hipsters have a real real fascination with like hanging out or being around that sort of energy i don't know what it is maybe it's the danger it's like um it's like those uh there's this thing in the gay scene where, where they kind of like they like to they like to kind of dress up like chavs and wear like track suits and wear or like uh shots right like uh uk like drug dealers right street goons or whatever they mean i don't know what international people call them but you know shots like little youths on the street on road whatever they like to kind of wear that side bag and track suits and air maxes and hats and stuff like it's big in the gay scene and and, and they sometimes like guys to dress up like that right they want to like um fuck someone that looks like that um the girls want to hang around with people that sort of energy so it's not to say that oh what do you expect but i'm just i just think that that sort of you just can't put that kind of energy together in this one room and expect it to be harmonious especially when you don't have good um internal hr uh, processes right for people to report these kind of things because I, I don't i'd hate to fit i'd hate to imagine what it must be like to be a girl in this environment and try and report that s someone right don't know who but let's say someone in that building right touched you up right like like would you would like you've seen these guys at close quarters right and you've known them you've see, heard the things that they speak about you've heard the kind of um uh you've heard the way they describe certain situations that would you know that would kind of like you know strike the fear of god in, in most people and then you're gonna go and tell someone that when you gave him a hug he reached down and touched your bum Whew, you don't know what's gonna happen so i, I, I my, my, my thoughts only go out to those girls had to kind of put up with, with that my thoughts also go out kind of a little bit weirdly enough to the kind of guys in there who kind of didn't know what to do right didn't know what to tell to report it to stick up for someone because that kind of environment also you don't come from an environment where it's weird right you come from an environment where you know it's dog eat dog sort of thing but it's also interesting to see the reaction from people on the outside who are, who kind of always hated radar right because the founder of radar radio um is the son of mike ashley so obviously someone that comes from a lot of wealth and um a predominantly white um, group of lads sort of like started the station obviously with investment from mike ashley but you know he's a rich kid who, who's probably got more money than god right who doesn't need to do this and he's went out of his way because he enjoys the music uh to set up radar radio and put it out i've heard a rumor right that that guy that set up radar radio mike ashley's son um the former owner of um newcastle i heard supposedly he's the voice on one of rick ross tunes like there's a skit on one of rick ross's album I'm not sure which one it is where the guy says um it's like raining and he's, he's reading a, a poem it's like a british guy reading a poem or something like that and at the end of it he goes ah oh, uh two socks two ankles you do the maths or something like that I, I heard that that was mike ashley's son who said that supposedly i'm not sure if that's true but anyways like he went out of his way to do that he set up a station right he put all these people on and allowed them to stream all across the world right and now because of this controversy which is obviously a real thing it's a big topic but everyone's it seems like everyone's kind of using it people that hate him use the opportunity to kind of kick him while he's down or kick them while they're down and i think that's a bit unfair um i also think i've read a lot of kind of entitled posts from a few people right who kind of feel as if like um because i think there's a sentiment which i kind of echoed a bit on twitter on social media where i was also thinking of like yeah this is a great opportunity for people to actually go and start their own station right i think Jammer said something about he's going to start his own station off the back of it because i remember he had a kind of a beef with a, one of the guys on the station a kind of a little bit of a tit for tat that was quite entertaining so he he's kind of putting his mouth um he's kind of uh putting his money where his mouth is and kind of doing the job but I remember someone reading write an article. Might have it in my notes actually that they didn't think it was a they didn't that they were getting annoyed that people were suggesting that they should go and start their own thing because essentially you know this guy kind of put his money where his mouth is and kind of got burnt you know as you as you might as it might happen in business um, 
you obviously don't want it to happen under these circumstances. No, you don't want, you know what I mean? You don't want to get shut down because of sexual allegations and because you've, you've got an environment that kind of encourages that sort of behavior. But, you know, you've, you've done something, you made it happen. And for the most part, these guys are on those stations. These, these stations are usually freeloaders, you know, freeloaders who kind of, once they get, once they get a show or they get a position, they act as if like they made it like, like they're the founder, which is always weird to me, right? So they're like middle managers who act like owners. It's like you're not an owner. You're you're probably even less than a middle manager. Do you know what I mean? You, you pay rent. Or, I don't know if you pay rent or pay sales, or whatever it is. And you got a show, which is great, but relax a little bit. And these are the same people who are now like kind of you know making these weird kind of soppy um, Twitter or social media statements. And then what 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 happens to their show? You know, then they're not they don't have the wherewithal to just make their own thing you know especially nowadays like i'm recording this on a shitty webcam and putting up onto youtube it's like it's not that big of a deal you can figure it out and or you can kind of pull your resources and do it together but i think so, a girl mentioned something or someone mentioned something about like they didn't think it was a good idea that people were encouraging people to make their own stations who said this can i find the topic da, 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 da. trench trench that one what happens in the industry wide issue Oh, actually, let me click this and see what they said here. This might be a good place to start. So this article um, on Trench says, "What happened at Radar Radio is indicative of, a, of an industry-wide issue." I'm always, I'm always a bit, you know, come on, industry-wide, mm, not really, you know. You, you have some dickheads working in your building, like it's not industry-wide thing, you know. And if it is an industry-wide thing, it's a hu- it's a world thing. It's not like an industry thing. It's like it affects everyone in every sort of area. Um, one of the. Da, 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 da. I don't know, should I read all this actually? I'm probably not. Oh, actually, um, let's see here. Let's read one, because this is again, this is why I say I, you can't mix hipsters and goons. You just can't. Uh, another one, um, this lady, or uh, not lady, who, who's written this? Jesse Bernard. It's not probably not lady, probably a guy, because my little brother Jesse, his name's Jesse, and he spells his name the same way. Anyway, someone from Trench Trench um, wrote this article about the radar radio thing, and they write, and I quote, another woman producer... Uh, anonymously shared her experience with me like many other DJs she was learning to DJ while working there for six months in 2016 she recalls a night where a prominent DJ was playing a set with about 12 other MCs present in the room I was offered drinks and started to get a bit waved the room was getting hot and packed and I felt someone grab a handful of my thigh she says (laughs) while this occurred during a live broadcast the then 20 year old explained she how she froze couldn't say a thing and couldn't say a thing after confiding in a friend she went into she went on to say that within a few weeks of the incident i felt every time i came to radar the women who worked there staring at me and random them were trying to hit on me Ugh. this is why i say goons and hipsters can't be in the same area when i mean hipsters i mean fashionistas scene people you can't be friends I know Skepta likes some of you guys, right? For the most part. And he's like, he's like a decent lad. And he seems like everyone around him seems like a, a decent person, right? You don't hear, really hear any sort of nonsense um, from their crew apart from, who's the guy? Is it Solo 4 or 5? He's in prison for like 100 years for what, raping. But that's his own sort of like deviancy, right? He went out like Batman and was raping people, right? Which is bad to say, I know, eh? Whatever. But it seems like he was doing it, you know, f- uh, for lack of a better pun, solo, right? But, as an in, as as a genre, right, or as a musical scene, that scene doesn't bode well with you guys, man. It doesn't blend well with fashionistas. It does does not. These guys come from very harsh realities where that is a norm. I've been in a house party, right? When I when I where I grew up in Custom House, right, and Canning Town and Stratford, or where I used to go out sometimes to Forest Gate, but sometimes you get beat up there because you want you didn't go send bonds or whatever it may be, blah blah blah. But I remember going to house parties when I was under sixteen and being in rooms where there were 12 people or there was 12 guys for every one girl, right? I remember that. And that, not, not in the beginning of the night. Don't say, oh, you left in the beginning when no one's come yet and you're really early. No, 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 no. It's just from the ver- to begin to the end. And this is an era when Bashman was a prominent music that was being played, right, in these parties. Bashman was a prominent music being played. Not grime, not R&B, not hip-hop, Bashman. 
which if you know anything about bashment it requires a man and a woman usually sometimes it can be whatever you want it to be but for the most part it requires a man and a woman to grind against each other vigorously right vigorously right sometimes throwing the other person up in the air um hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet right <laughs> in a sweaty 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 environment so imagine being a guy in that room and there's only five girls to choose from what it must what must happen right it just you just go nuts and and the the common decency level the bar of like gentlemanly the kind of the attitude that's expected in that room is so low like for the most part there might be good guys in there but what's a good guy gonna do in a room full of absolute gorillas like where everyone's kind of grabbing everything and you're like oh excuse me would you mind dancing with me you're gonna get nothing so what do you do? You you kind of assimilate to your environment and you also become a creep. You also become a jerk. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not like I'm excusing it, but that's the nature of that group of people, right? So to mix those two people in, in an effort to kind of like um, creatively inspire yourself or to make it, I don't know, it's just, it's just not a good idea. I just don't think it's a good idea, unfortunately. Now, this girl shouldn't be in a position where she wants to see some guys uh, spit, right? Uh, uh, and what you call it, a gram session, people like rapping or whatever, doing their thing. She, she shouldn't be in a room where people are freestyling and feel as if like she might get sexually assaulted. Like, that's not on. No one's saying it is on. But we have to understand that hipsters and goons just do not mix. They just don't. I'm sorry, they don't mix. Especially in an environment like that too, right? Where, for the most part, everyone kind of feels like an owner when they're, when they're not. Or, for the most part, where everyone's kind of, like, on that weird tr journey where they're sort of, like, trying to make it in a kind of creative scene where there's no real rules, no real blueprint. Sometimes things get a bit foggy, right? You start to accept things that you really shouldn't be accepting because you, think, you feel as if, like, oh, you never know, right? Um, such and such might i don't know there's this weird cloud that hangs around the creative industry sometimes especially when people are just starting to figure stuff out that sometimes you allow stuff that you you never allow never allow in a million years in any other scenario so i think for the most part this should be a wake-up call to everyone man like let's be very aware of who we keep in our company let's be very aware of what energy we're inviting um in our homes in our studios in our workshops wherever it may be in our events um, and let's also understand that there are big cultural, uh, socioeconomic, um, philosophical even, right? Differences between groups that need to be addressed before you decide to put them in a room together. It's just one of those things. Or they need to be acknowledged, first of all. You can't just say like, you can't just be plucking people out from the streets, giving them an op-ed and think they're going to function in your world. It just isn't going to happen, man. You need to... It's, it's it's a training process uh if i may say so myself or it's a it's maybe a thing of like a muse from afar do you know what i mean it doesn't it's not something you kind of have to like i don't know i just i just i, I just i just i'm not surprised man this is I'm, I'm sorry to say that that account is horrible imagine being that girl and you're in a room full of what is that um you're in a room full of 12 mcs right and a dj and you're getting touched up as well it's like an and it sounds like she was like in the dj where the dj was right trying to keep herself away from harm and the dj was always the one that kind of touched her up it's like ugh, it's annoying so yeah that that was news that's come out a while ago that i kind of wanted to let my two cents on and i guess you know the day where they are i'm not sh can they bounce back from this i'm not too sure you know the internet never forgets um you can't go around touching up girls and having a culture where this kind of happens like over and over and over again right um i'm not sure what they can say the kind of reds to kind of like help this but then again like i said like creatives or people in the scene are so hungry for exposure they're so unwilling to kind of like put their money where their mouth is and do their own thing launch their own product launch their own platform or i don't know whatever it may be right that if they kind of maybe said the right words and turned on the station again and announced that it was going to be free subs for the rest of the year i think everyone will jump back on it again man like they really would i, I like they, they have to like a good a good example right i see this girl a couple of times in stratford because i think she must live in the same area as me i don't know what her name is um and i'm not going to google it because i don't want it to i don't want the algorithms to fuck up my thing and start showing me the stuff right but she seems cool don't get me wrong i just you know whatever um the mixture of girl with pink hair curly hair who's got a show on radar don't know what her name is right but I've seen a couple times in Stratford. A very striking and attractive young lady, right? Um, it seems to me from the 
thumbnail picture of a video I've seen ages ago that she's like got like a talk show, right? like a chat show where she plays music and she maybe does games. I don't know where it may be, right? Like a, like a reg, like a hot 97 thing, right? Why is that girl need to go on radar radio? Like, tell me, why don't she just have a vlog? Why don't she just have a vlog where she sets up a, sets up a little thing in her house or in the studio um, invites her friends around or whoever they may be like she probably should, i'm pretty sure she's got like a cool group of friends and does her own thing why does she need to be on radar radio she doesn't need that association um i have the same i have the same sort of like feelings towards nts in the same sort of way right there's a weird like oh you know everything on there is cool mm, no like you know some things on there are not not that great but also there's this thing of like you know if this thing happened to nts which god forbid it shouldn't but you know go do your own thing man like you don't need to have a station. It's a good exposure. Like they've built their own name, which they've done amazing to do that, right? They've what they kind of world recognized as like you know the kind of go to people like Boiler Room and NTS of like you know of like it being a tap of the underground, maybe even rinse. But it's like I just get annoyed at the, the more so the people that are on it, right? As opposed to the guys that own it. The people that are on it are the ones that are annoying, right? The, the actual NTS DJ people, right? Or the actual radar radio people, because you know they have this weird sense of ownership when they don't own anything. And then when things like this happen, it, I don't really see any action. I don't see anyone. Ba- I've, I've seen Jamma say he wants to do something, but I don't know. I've not really looked into it again. Maybe I'm talking from an ignorant point. And everyone's got their own thing that they're doing, but I don't know, man. Use the opportunity to do your own thing, dude. But yeah, Radar Radio, RIP for now. Maybe they come back, maybe they don't. Who knows? Um, what else is on the ticket here? Um, bloody blah. Oh, Sheck West. Yeah, check this out. Check West, check West, check West, check West, check West, check West. Um, I've, I just finished actually this interview, which was absolutely amazing. I recommend you check it out too. Um, check West, new rapper on the scene, 90 years old. Um, you might have heard of him. You might not have heard of him, but he's got an amazing, great story. And you gave an interview with uh, No Jumper the other day recently. Um, it's been a... It's been a while since I've watched a, a No Jumper interview, actually, to be honest. Um, I, I've kind of, like, kind of, no, I, I usually bunch watch them. I watch them in bunches, right? Um, I used to watch them all the time, but I kind of, you know, had enough. You know, they were kind of the same, you know, especially the artists ones. So they all kind of had come from the same sort of background-y type stuff, you know, um, interest, la, 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 la. But I found Sequest's story really, really um, interesting, mo- mo- mostly because of his real african roots like here because there's a lot of african americans who aren't that really in tune with africa for the most part right um especially because a lot of them don't really know where in africa they're from because of the slave trade um but he seems to be very in tune with his african roots mostly because of his parents and his family are from senegal they kind of sent him back for various periods he's 19 he's been back to senegal three or four times in that period right which is crazy but the bit that really intrigued me was the super African bits, right? Um, I think I've written a couple of them down here that I wanted to speak about. What was it? La, la, la. Oh, um, I want to give Adam22 a big shout out, actually. Adam22 is an amazing interviewer, especially for that scene, right? That kind of SoundCloud mumble rap um, kind of scene. I'd say that only because if you've ever spoken to... If, you're, if you've ever spoken to someone 10 years younger than you, you know how hard it is to have... You know how hard it is to talk to people 10 years younger than you? Let alone having to interview them, let alone being friends with them, let alone trying to help them with their careers, right? How hard it must be to kind of like navigate through that environment because they're just, you know, they're... Imagine when you were six, you were that age, right? Under 21 or under 27. You're still figuring everything out. Like everything was a bit, you know, a bit muddy, a bit weird, right? Especially, and then then imagine adding on top of that notoriety, fame, money into that equation, how you're going to be, you're going to be a bit, you know, you, you got to be a bit off and adults aren't necessarily going to get, aren't actually going to get what you want, get what you need. Um, they're honestly going to understand you or say the right words. So Adam is a really underrated interviewer for that scene and he does a really good job of um, extracting the kind of interesting parts or just, and, on, and even just allowing it to, the, the person to speak. He was really good in this interview where I can't, it kind of started off a bit cold, but as they kind of warmed up, um, Adam did a, just really backed off and and allowed Sheck to kind of express himself and really dive deep and get into tough topics that he probably didn't think he was going to speak about, right? And this this is going to be a seminal interview. This is going to be, if Sheck ends up being as big as he, he, I think he's going to be, this is going to be one of those interviews where you look back on and think, oh, wow, like I remember when he said this and that. And it's the kind of interview that I think most artists should do 
like a real big long form interview where you kind of get out a lot of your character but you don't do a lot of them don't go around i, I remember there was, a, there was a time when the podcast thing was really popping off in hip-hop and everyone was doing drink champs uh everyday struggle another podcast i don't know whatever there's um rap rap radar uh combat jack r.i.p people kept people replacing those shows with the from the breakfast club and the hot 97 but that doesn't work anymore because hot 97 breakfast club were doing long form interviews kind of copying what podcasts were doing so what you should be doing if you're an artist in my opinion if you're an artist out there and you need some help holler at a kid but what i think you should be doing is that you should be using a podcast especially something that's either something very hyper niche right in your in your industry or something that's hyper niche in another industry right and having a long form interview and only doing that only one long form interview the rest of them you can do to maybe do a promo of a show you've got coming up for 20 minutes or even less right but only one long form only one hour and one twenty hour and 120 minutes uh interview with one person and then use that as a kind of place for people to go to to kind of deep have a deep dive on who you are as a person what makes you tick for real right behind the music behind whatever you do i think that's a really really good um kind of uh marketing strategy and just a general real good way to kind of brand yourself right and to kind of like really separate yourself from the crowd people can kind of really get an idea of who you are for real so i thought this interview was great um they spoke about so many different things that hopefully you guys can hear on here but yeah um in general great 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 interview um i'm a fan of Sheck now um definitely recommend you check him out Sheck wes or Sheck wes on there his real name is fucking nuts as well he kind of says it in the beginning so definitely you check that out uh, la, la, la. and what else i want to talk about oh met gala should i talk about met gala or should i do that another time met gala let's go at met gala actually met gala 2018 outfits yeah 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 um heavenly bodies was the theme as per usual the men were absolute pants and the girl some of the girls or some of the ladies were amazing actually before we talk about um the met gala or the Met Gala, or the Met Gala, Gala Mele, we're gonna, I'm gonna quickly run over and get a beer, or maybe just like this joint, before we talk about the Met Gala, but let's just, let's get on the Met Gala, man, let's get on the Met Gala wave, Met Gala wave, wave Met Gala, let's make sure this screen is on, it's showing, oops, get out of there, it's showing the screen, yep, cool, alright, let's get on, let's get on the Met Gala wave, Met Gala, let's go on the slideshow, actually going to spark up a joint probably won't get arrested on on the old stream hopefully not anyway let's see if they got all the outfits all listed here live blog inside performances what's this is it oh all, all, all the celebrity outfits cool let's do this i'll do this live so let me get i'm gonna grab a beer as well before we begin Wait, podcasting really is the best if you're if you, if you listen to this and you don't have one yourself please consider starting a podcast you know you could even do it with an app called anchor they they let you do it kind of record a podcast on your phone and you can kind of get it out straight away or you can just do what i used to do before and record them on voice notes and just upload them to soundcloud you know just do it raw but it's so fun man you know where else can you go all right spark up a little <laughs> get grab yourself a beer and talk about Met Gala 2018, man. Where else can you do that? Um, so yeah, Met Gala outfit, outfit, outfits. The guys are, like I said, were fucking horrendous, right? For the most part, right? The men were just, you know, like, what's the point? First off, let's start with the good, right? Or oh, I'm just gonna flick through the slideshow. Why not? Because I think that's fun, right? To do that sort of thing. Let me make this full screen so you can see that on the on the old uh, OBS or your podcast and again if you're not if you're not watching this on youtube then i'm gonna click i'll put the slideshow link on the description but i'm sure if you if you're on social media i'm sure you've seen these pictures already so you probably don't even need to see them again but you definitely need to click and subscribe my uh, youtube or podcast channel because <laughs> that's a that's a big job anyway blake lively number one i thought she looked great i thought blake looked awesome you don't really see her uh, I don't really feel like you see her that often out and about anymore, um, especially on red carpet. She seems to have kind of regressed and kind of gone back into 
and to just being an, an actress, right? And just doing her thing that way, which is amazing. I actually watched a movie that she was in a while back, um, the one with uh, Ben Affleck, uh, the one where he robs banks. What's that called? Oh. She's amazing in it. She plays like a junkie. Um, what's that movie called? Let me, let me get, let me get up on the stream. Let me get up on my phone and see if I can remember the name of it. It's a, it's a, maybe someone <coughs> at home is shouting about it. That's why you shouldn't smoke on camera. Because you cough like that and everyone thinks you're a loser. Blake Lively. Um, what's his name? Oh, what did I say his name was? The Batman guy. Fuck. Uh, bank robbery movie. Bank robbery. Let's see if that works. Oh, I forgot his name. Just said it now. Jesus Christ. My memory, man. It's going to absolute shit, mate. That's it. Town. The Town. Or Town, right? That's an amazing movie. Check, I definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, the Town uh, starring... Who's the guy I mentioned? I forgot. Ben Affleck. Uh, Jamie Renner. Who's in... What else is he playing? He's a good actor, actually, that guy. He's in... What's that movie where he plays uh, a guy in the Antarctic... He's got to undercover some murder of a girl that died. Uh, a Native Indian girl. Native American girl. Native Indian. Anyway, great movie. Highly recommend you check it out. So, Blake's looks amazing. I4, number one. Again, look how long I'm spending on this already. This lady, not a fan. Sorry. What's your name? Uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. No. No, thank you. Um, Adoa Aboa. Um, not a fan at all. I thought she, I thought she'd come a bit more. I thought she'd come much harder than that. It looks quite auntie-ish the, the dress itself. Um, I'm not a fan. Of the, I'm not a fan of her dyeing her hair. I thought she should have just kept it blonde. I don't think the dye actually worked with the outfit at all. By the way, cheers. In case you're listening, um, I just cracked open a little tin of Heineken because I'm watching. You know, I'm rewatching the glorious pictures from the Met Gala 2018. Why wouldn't I be drinking um, Heineken? This young lady here is... Is that North Korean Survivor? Wendy Wu? No, it's not, is it? I think when the, it's the other one, right? It was the one in red, I think. Maybe Lee Wen, I think so. Um, either way, not a fan of the outfits. Congrats for surviving, but not a fan of your outfits. Uh, Kristen Scott Thomas in Erdem. Nope, not a fan either. Um, oh, I thought... I thought Sienna Miller looked... Sienna Miller looked amazing, right? Sienna Miller's wearing Louis Vuitton... And Fred Layton jewelry with a Jimmy Choo bag. She looked brilliant. For those listening, she's wearing like a a white long sleeve top, amazing on the body, a little bit baggy on the arms, with an, with some great jewelry. It sort of looks like a. It kind of looks like, you know the you know the um, what do they call them the floats that you put on the side of boats, right? So it kind of but made out made out of silver and diamonds and shit. So it's kind of like, you know, it's got like the rope and you've got the kind of floats inside the boat. She's got an amazing, I don't know if that is even silver. I'd, 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 I'd love to feel that material. I'd love to feel her. Yeah. And a nice little white clutch. She looks stunning and an amazing crown. Like, Sienna Miller looks amazing. She's grown old so well. Now, I'm not just, now again, this is me saying this um, without knowing the gossip. She probably, she might have had some work done. I don't know if she has or hasn't, but I'm going to take it on face value. And I'll say Sienna Miller's aged amazingly well mate she looks hot as fuck like she looks definitely like a nice hot um an amazingly attractive west london mummy Sienna Miller looks awesome um what's his name um little puff sean christian combs chris Con- i wasn't a fan of his outfit at all i thought he was doing way way too much should have he could have done that outfit a lot better than it could have been it looks on him or maybe he just doesn't look that good in clothes. I'm not sure what it is with Chris, with, with um, young Christian Combs, because he does, he does, he does wear a lot of Dolce Gabbana, doesn't he? He's always on the runway for D and G when they always, when they kind of when they kind of uh, rent all the influencers for one day and fly them all down to Italy to wear their gaudy clothes. Um, but yeah, I'm not a fan of the outfit at all. I thought the out. I thought this. These these are the outfits I kind of saw a lot, especially with women. Um, this lady is called Nika Arganaza. Arganaza. I'm assuming she's a model because she has legs for days. Um, 
but she had like a you know um the new what's his name anthony balakareka whatever his name is the new uh creative director of saint Laurent. the guy that got to replace heidi Slimane. he's got a particular look that he likes right these wide shoulders um really short skirts high boots or kind of like you know calf like kind of calf length boots right so loads of legs showing he's kind of got the same silhouette that he uses it's sort of like a sophisticated it's sort of like a less blingy version of balmain right like uh, you know high rise skirts big shoulders powerful legs but it's not the kind of look you'd want to wear for a catholic themed heavenly bodies um, met gala exhibition right it's a little bit too red carpety or like you know after party vibes it looks like right or maybe she just, she just couldn't have to change that that could be an option too <laughs> another um asian superstar who i wasn't really a fan of the outfit wise and none of the asian ladies gave a shit about the theme i don't think they came in specifically just to kind of appease their asian market and also to kind of pick up that bag you know what i mean but i don't think any of the asian ladies actually cared especially i'm assuming there's they're celebrities from the asian market right like big 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 stars but yeah I wasn't necessarily a fan of either of any of those kind of looks from them, to be honest. Uh, Claire Danes, a girl from Homeland, didn't look great at all. She This dress is not flattering in the slightest. This has to be said. Let me uh, zoom in a little bit here. It's not sl it's not flattering at all. No way, Jose. Another lady who kind of wore a going out sort of jack uh, outfit, which I wasn't a fan of, Charlotte Casarigi. Um, she's very pretty anyway in general, but you know, this outfit just doesn't do it for me. Maybe the boots just doesn't not a fan of it. Oh, this I'm a fan of, totally. Um, Joanne Smalls in Tommy Hilfiger and Philip Tracy and uh, Philip Tracy or Tracy um headpiece. She looks great. Sort of like a gold a gold statue. But is it me or sometimes with people who are light skinned that wear this kind of caramel colour always look a bit weird, right? So always look like you're kind of naked. Especially when you zoom out a bit and you squint. Kinda of like she's naked sometimes, which is a bit odd, I know to say, but I don't know. It's a bit like me. I, I don't I tend not to wear dark brown at all, if ever, right? Or even sometimes or even khaki or cream sometimes. I don't know, I just feel as if like I don't know. You just feel naked sometimes. But Outfit wise, she smashed it. Joan Small, so well done, my dear. Lewis Hamilton, it's not even worth getting started on Luther. How bad his outfit is, like from the top to the bottom, man. It's just an absolute car crash. With guys, it's weird because you kind of get an idea your outfit's shit. But the moment you put on your shoes, I'm not sure if, if other guys feel the same way, but I know I do, right? I put on my shoes, and sometimes I can just realize straight away when I put my shoes on, like this is a dead outfit. And you have to make a decision right then and then whether you're going to try and correct it. Or you're just happy to just have a dead outfit. You're just going to like ride it out. And I've sometimes had to ride it out. But he looks like he thinks he looks sick. And he looks horrible. And you know why he looks horrible? Which is a good option. Which is a good, which is a bad and a good thing sometimes, right? You know you look really bad when you don't see your picture on most of the big sort of like... Um, the guys in the back are always funny in their faces, the photographers. I think someone should make us a, a, a collage of them on Instagram. Maybe I'll do that, actually. Um, you always look... You know you look bad on these kind of things when you're not circulating amongst all the big sort of like, you know, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter accounts that kind of regurgitate or repost this stuff. And you know you look really good when everyone posts your thing. But then you're sometimes in the middle where you, sometimes people are saying you're good, sometimes not. But I've not seen Lewis Hamilton's picture anywhere. I've got to be honest, a anywhere, like, especially saying anything good, it's sort of like avoid that at all. Number one, the boots, right? They're just horrible, right? I don't know what he's wearing, he's wearing those boots, but, you know, just on on their own, the boots are shit, right? These sort of like white Dr. Martins kind of style boots, but not even not the cool as Dr. Martins at all with like diamonds and shit in it. You know, he's a Formula One racing car driver, you know, like he's got more money than God. There's There's bound to be some mistakes there, right? Uh, he's got white pants on that match his white suit jacket and the pant suit and the pant suit legs are uh have been hemmed, right? Have been kind of like rolled over. I don't know why. Don't ask me. I just don't know why, right? So he's got these weird high water trousers on that he's kind of like rolled up. He's got jewelry on that doesn't he's got like a rosary thing that's been hidden by long arms of a jacket that doesn't really fit that well. He's got embroideries on the lapel of the suit jacket, embroideries again on side is that a waistcoat? Yeah, he's got a waistcoat inside the 
jacket with lapels embroidered in it and a shirt with more embroideries in it and then he's got earrings with a cross on it like it's like oh, god man but i don't know maybe it's a thing of like not having a stylist maybe it's a thing of like hiring the wrong stylist maybe it's a thing of like you know because he's a you know he's a good looking guy he he races in formula one he's got loads of disposable income he 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 he's got access to some of the most desirable names out there it's like you've got to do better man you've got to do better lewis hamilton you have to do better like that outfit was an abs- that, that that's that's gonna be a no for me dog like who's who, that's the guy from uh american idol right it's a no for me dog like no thank you um who's this this is uh kate upton right just i don't really have time for her in general like i don't you know what I mean you, are you looking to check? Is anyone checking for Kate Upton's outfits? Really? I know I'm checking for one. I see Kate Upton. It's not the outfits. <laughs> um, uh, and it's Alexa Chung. I'll pass. I'm not. I just. I don't get it. I don't get why she's in it, girl. Like I don't, just don't get it. Like I don't. I'm sorry. Um, she seems really fun. She seems cool. She was fun. She seems like she would be a laugh and stuff. But I just don't get why she's in it, girl. Like at all. Like she's. She's just so boring, man. Like, she just looks so boring, you know? Just boring. Incredibly boring. And just, you know, just boring. Not in a bad way, but just boring. And eight girls shouldn't be boring. They're dynamic, right? Eight girls are like Kate Moss, you know? Like, falling out of the club, you know? Like, purse bills are everywhere. And there's bags all over the place, you know what I mean? Scupping them in. And you've got amazing, ju- you're, wearing, you're wearing Pound of Love jewelry on. And like, Isabella Marant boots like especially pre-2004 you've got amazing jeans on nice leather jacket you know what i mean you just look bad you're just sick you know what I mean? you just i don't know but she's just, just maybe an it girl for like people that read grazia and stuff right right maybe like that right like if you're an older kind of lady but you've got this like fashionista raging inside of you that you've kind of tamed and then you kind of live vicariously through alexa chung but i'm cool with her man and the outfit is just like meh 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 I thought Diplo looked quite cool, personally. I think I think he's got swag, man. He carried his outfit off quite cool. I, I think he could have gone with a robe or some of some sort, right? Um, uh, a frock, as Joe Budden loves, loves to refer them as. I think that he would have looked sick in that. I think, but he think he, he looked okay. Another Asian lady who I don't care about. Um, Salma Hayek, no, no thank you. This, uh, I don't know who you are. I'm just not going to say your name. Uh, what's this lady's name? That's not Jennifer Connolly, is it? Really? Okay, maybe it is. Okay, anyway, uh, Jennifer Connolly, I wasn't a fan of her outfit at all. Um, it just, I don't know, it just doesn't look that great to me personally. I think that top bit kind of throws me off a little bit. Uh, Louis Vuitton, so I'm assuming this is, uh, what's his face? The um, emo creator director of Louis Vuitton. Oh, the name escapes me. But, probably made amazing right because he's one of the best designers in the world but i just don't like it on her i don't think it works that well uh idris elba just wore a black tux so he gets a nil point from me um sarah paulson and Ma- michael b jordan sarah paulson is wearing a prada um dress which is near a here or there but michael b jordan is just wearing a horrendous off-white suit that just doesn't look great at all maybe because he's just too wham Right, he's just two blonks, like he doesn't look that great in suits. Because I don't know, when's the last time you've seen someone really hench that looks great in suits, right? So he's just maybe he's just two blonks, but I just hate the suit itself. The massive patch on the sleeve, obviously with all the off white code names and shit on it, right? With the speech bubbles and with the speech marks and shit. The belt uh, the belt he's wearing like inside the jacket, that's also outside the jacket, it's just annoying as well. It's just all wrong for me. I'm not a fan of that. That'll be a no for me, dog. Uh, who else is here ah um jordan dunn looked for i thought looked okay maybe minus the shoes and the hair i don't think the hair worked well with the outfit and the shoes just weird right um he just kind of you know zooming like that right does it work jordan dunn like that i think that looks nice i don't think the shoes and the hair work that well for me personally so i wasn't a fan of her outfit this lady i don't know why she wore a jacket on her shoulder but you know neither here or there um this one i can give a pass to as well this i'll pass to let me try to get the ones i actually liked and then i can just maybe comment on those a little bit because
because some of these ones are just, you know, they weren't that great, really. Oh, Selena Gomez looked really weird, didn't she? I'm not sure if she's pregnant or if she's just high or something, but she had that weird face where she was sort of like in pain or some shit. The dress was horrible, too. Um, do you know my nanny used to lay off the hats? Um, she's got an amazingly pretty face and great hairstyles that I've seen her do sometimes. And the outfit's just like, I don't know. I'm just not a fan of it. And just lay off the hats. Too many hats, please. No more hats. Miley Cyrus. Look at Miley Cyrus going to a red carpet event, you know. Miley Cyrus, it's always like, um, it's always like a red carpet at the top. Uh, elegance at the bottom in it. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, her, her face usually gives away where she's been. You know I mean, she's got very expressive. If you know what I mean about my side, red carpet looks like you can tell it's Miley Cyrus just from the face alone. Like you know, um, body wise, you, you you could think like you know that could be any number of like very attractive, slim uh, Hollywood actresses, right? You you would you wouldn't be able, maybe if you recognize the tattoos, you'd be able to cheat, but the face you could tell for sure where she's been, right? Been on the little oldie bender. Talk about old Scarlett Johansson looks. Not so very, very gaudy in this outfit. I wasn't a fan of it at all. And I thought Virgil looked sick, personally. I think a lot of people are saying Virgil didn't look good, but I thought the outfit looked great on Virgil. He, he usually... He, whenever I've seen him in pictures, he comes... I think maybe he's practiced because he's, he's been out and about a lot lately, right? Especially in the last year and a half. He's been getting his pictures taken everywhere. But he seems like he's... um His posture is better. He stands a little bit better than before. He used to always look a bit weird when he used to wear stuff. Like, he just had a weird, like gangly way of standing and walking but he looks much cooler now in the stuff that he's wearing um in general anyway i think he just carries the stuff better and i think this outfit you can tell what an atelier this is why i mean when i mentioned before about we're gonna see the best version of virgil at louis vuitton because people are saying no he's gonna see the worst because he's got the access to everything and he's gonna do shit no you're not understanding it he's got great ideas as he as proven by those off-white trainers right they're probably one of the greatest pieces of design or that collection in general the nike 10 probably one of the best creation best pieces of design in i don't know in forever right they're gonna go down in history as like well do you remember when those came out right like this gonna be one of those kind of things people are gonna study that shit like they were genius level quality of shoes right like hiroshi level quality right so he's obviously shown that he can do cool things like a belt that i wear every day right that's amazing right a cool, he took something that i had in my i thought about it for a long time but again i didn't do it so it doesn't matter but he took something so mundane every day and turned it into an incredibly luxury item uh the whatever you think of the quote marks a genius branding and marketing piece so he's got great ideas and sometimes he doesn't have the finesse or maybe the resources to really present high level work but I think if you place him in an environment, especially in Louis Vuitton, with that atelier, right, with people who've been working in that atelier for, I don't know, 50 plus years, yeah, right, hand sewing shit, right, real couture, uh, none of this internet shit, right, real fucking couture with clients that come, that go in there every season to season out, regardless who the designer is, we're going to see the best version of Virgil, I think, in my opinion, I think we're going to see the best of him in there, and I can't wait to see this new collection. I'm eager to know, though, whether or not Jaden is wearing a jacket designed by Virgil 2, a new collection. I don't know if, it's, if that's true, but the outfit-wise, I thought that outfit looked sick. I thought he suited him really, really well. Um, another man who I'm just going to pass on. I don't care who this guy is. Oh, um, Emily Wojciechowski, obviously, body is just, like, on absolute one million. Uh, outfit was great. Um, Cassie didn't look that great to me, in my opinion. I thought Nikki looked all right. Um, who else? Let's quickly maybe scan through some of these. Jimmy Kemmel and whatever. Oh, Wiz Khalifa looks great in his suit. Um, the suit itself, I'm not really a fan of. I think a lot of people are saying he looks like a blunt, right? <laughs> a backward, which was which was funny. It's a Dior suit. It fits him a lot better now because he's bulked up a bit, right? Everyone's kind of saying it fits amazing because he's kind of got a little bit more muscle. He's filling it out more. And he obviously was incredibly, he obviously looks incredibly, incredibly skinny. But now when you feel like that frame, he's got like a good long frame. You're going to look amazing and close, so hopefully he continues doing it. And if you don't know why he filled it out, check out his Instagram because he's been doing a lot of MMA lately. And, yeah, he looks great in clothes now. Um, not now, but, like, he's filling them out way better than he was before. So he's going to look amazing going forward. So that was okay, I'd say. I'm not really a fan of the suit color itself. Uh, Cara Delevingne, I wasn't a fan of her outfit at all. Um, Kim, I wasn't really a fan. I love the makeup. But this lady, she smacked it. Zedenia, right? Zedenia smashed it. She looked amazing. The only thing I'd fault I'd say about her is I wish it came. I wish it came with like a fake sword, 
like some sort of like just like a prop just a, like kind of full cosplay that would look amazing like maybe super dust studded out or maybe even just on the side as a little prop that would have been so cool or maybe even just had like a own version of like a a swordsman maybe carrying it behind her or something but i thought she looked so cool man so then you think smashed it red carpet looks in my opinion the makeup the hair like absolutely bang on uh solange looked didn't look too bad herself actually to be honest solange looked nice uh jeremy scott outfit i loved i didn't like the shoes cardi b's outfit i loved love love loved and there's a few others too who i will probably mention probably not worth mentioning it now because i'm sure everyone's tired of seeing the pictures oh rihanna of course looks amazing i wasn't really a fan of kylie and travis but it was great to see them on the catwalk. Is it, was it great to see them? I don't know. I don't really care. Was it great to see them? When Katja was saying these kind of corny things, it was great to see them. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> um, oh, my God. Anyway, but, yeah, um, Met Guy looked, looked great. Everyone looked like they were having loads of fun. And, you know, men always look shit in these kind of things because I'm, I'm guessing, you know, we don't really make... As, like I said in the beginning, you don't really want to make a mistake, right, and put yourself out there. Uh, the girls smashed it. Men look like shit because you don't want to make mistakes. But, hey whole what can you do uh if i went to the met gala one time i would definitely show out man i'm gonna i'm wearing an outfit for real for real you know but yeah that's where i'll end it i think maybe um met on the old met gala front i got have i got any more topics that i want to talk about um oh donald, donald glover this is america you've all seen that video right yeah it's amazing i probably i might actually end off end with that tune actually that might be a good way to end the podcast itself but anyway this has been the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 71, right? Episode number 71. It's been amazing to have you guys here, right, talking about stuff that you're probably not that interested in. And maybe you've learned a thing or two, right? Because I've spoken a lot about books, a lot about passions, a lot about dreams and all that sort of malarkey. And, yeah, hope you have got something from this podcast. And if you haven't, my sincere apologies. I'll be off now to Madrid for the weekend and then i'll probably go to the podcast when i come back so it'll be radio silence from me this weekend but if you're around london or if you're around stratford or east london ways and you want to go somewhere this bank holiday weekend on the 27th i'm putting on another party another party and if you're wondering what is that party you're putting on i guess you know it's called la betise at the heath curtain star on the 27th of may so if you're in the area and you want to go somewhere and have a little bit of a boogie on the bank holiday uh, weekend you can check it out the flash should be on the screen right now hopefully it's on there um yeah so i'm doing it at the heathcote star with my good friend lucas keen i can't wait to play some songs again it's been a while since i've been djing actually not a while actually it's been a couple of weeks but you know i would like to say it's been a while to keep myself nice and level and humble but yeah that should be great we're doing it on the sunday so five till late i might i might actually try to do some t-shirts too make some like little tall t-shirts i'm gonna put out so uh look out for that hopefully i'll have an update for you guys very soon on that front with the t-shirts but yeah i definitely want to make a t-shirt maybe like so it's always nice to have like a little tall band tee when you're djing with friends sometimes isn't it so hopefully i'll try and get that done and sorted out by then but if not come to the party anyway have a little dance sunday the 27th of may at the heathcote star which is on 344 grove green road Leighton Stone e 11 ea for more info just go to agassinozinga.com and you'll be able to see the flyer and if you see the flyer you're going to click on and go to the resident advisor event and you can add yourself to the list so yeah this has been the Agassino Zinga show episode number 71 thanks again for tuning in and being a part of it it means a lot to me and i'll see you guys again on the other side peace Doo-doo-doo.